47 minutes in complete silence, with only the twinkling of the stars in endless space to observe. 47 minutes orbiting the dark side of the moon with no way to contact Earth. Anybody else would be driven mad by the silence, scared without the communication, or anxious of what lurked in the great unknown of outer space. But for Apollo 11 pilot Michael Collins, it was an exciting moment in his life because he'd just broken the limits of human exploration. Although he was truly alone in his command module, he found solace in the fact that he was the first man to experience what lay beyond the dark side of the moon completely solo. This is the legacy of the world's loneliest man, Michael Collins. Communications are somewhat scratchy. Michael Collins was born on October the 31st, 1930, in Rome, Italy, as his father was an officer in the US Army and had been stationed as a military attaché there at the time of his birth. Due to his father's career in the Army, the Collins family moved around a lot in his youth. However, once the US joined the Second World War, the family was able to stay in Washington, DC, where Collins would complete high school. Despite his mother's wish that he join the Foreign Service, Colin was destined to follow his father's footsteps and attended the US Military Academy in West Point. After graduating from West Point, it appeared that Collins would also follow his father's military career by joining the Army. However, by this time, Collins' father was a major general, his brother a colonel, and even his uncle was a general and chief of staff, all for the US Army. Collins didn't want special treatment due to his family's careers in the army, nor did he want his future accomplishments attributed to nepotism, so Collins looked towards other branches of the military. At the time, the US Air Force was the newest branch of the military, but Collins was impressed by how quickly it adapted to new technologies and innovations. One such advancement was the use of jet engines in their aircraft. Planes were now faster, nimbler, and could reach extreme heights in a matter of seconds. Collins had always found aviation fascinating, but now he wanted the thrill of piloting a jet plane. So in 1952, Collins joined the Air Force. But little did he know that by doing so, he was about to put his life in immense danger. Collins began his training immediately, learning advanced formations and dogfighting skills using the F-86 Sabre Jet Fighter. These jets were nimble, fast, and played a vital role in creating air superiority in the Korean War. But Collins himself would not see combat. Instead, he would be put through rigorous training exercises, some including the simulation of delivering nuclear weapons on the enemy. Still, the intense training that Collins was put through would prove to be dangerous, as 11 people in his class would die from accidents. This didn't really affect him, though, as his colleagues would state that Collins felt little to no fear of failure. But disaster would strike Collins during a flight when a fire broke out right behind his cockpit. Luckily, he was able to eject and came out unscathed from the incident. Shortly afterwards, Collins would mostly stay grounded as he attended a course of aircraft maintenance. This annoyed him, though, as he had the need to be in the sky and his flight time had been significantly reduced. Perhaps it was this grounding that made Collins pursue training as a test pilot. As a test pilot, Collins returned to the sky, but now the stakes were higher as the planes that he flew were experimental fighter jets. Despite all his lack of fear of failure and the dangers of flying untested aircraft, Collins' career continued without another incident. But the events of the next few years would change not only his career direction, but the course of history too. In October 1957, a strange object flew across the sky, visible to most countries on Earth. Many believed it was a shooting star, but it was actually the world's first artificial satellite to reach space, Sputnik 1. 
This unprecedented event launched by the Soviet Union caused a frenzy in the United States. Prior to Sputnik's orbit around Earth, it was believed that the United States was superior in weapons and technology. But now the world realized that they were terribly behind the Soviet Union. This started the space race, a rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union to break the limits of the sky and invent new technologies to reach space. To the public, the space race was over exploration, but to the governments of the US and the Soviet Union, it was also over new weapon capabilities and advanced espionage. In response to Sputnik's flight, the US launched the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, to research and develop aviation technologies that would allow for the space exploration. However, even with NASA working tirelessly, the US would remain one step behind the Soviet Union. In 1961, the USSR successfully sent the first man to space with the Vostok 1 mission to orbit Earth. Space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space. With the United States needing a huge win over the USSR, President John F. Kennedy announced that the US would have a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The exploration of space will go ahead. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon and to the planets beyond. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The world was stunned by the declaration. But NASA was in shock, as they had no idea how such a feat would be accomplished. NASA continued their efforts, now with the objective to land a man on the moon, by launching the Mercury Project to test man's limits in space. It was during the Mercury Atlas 6 mission that John Glenn would become the first American to orbit Earth. Inspired by Glenn's flight, Michael Collins decided he would apply to the NASA program. John Glenn also had a background flying F-86 Sabre jets and had a career as a test pilot prior to joining the NASA program, so Collins seemed perfect for it. Collins was selected as a candidate for the program, but despite passing all his exams, he was rejected. He was determined to make it as an astronaut, so he signed up for a new course being offered by the Air Force that focused on the basics of spaceflight. In this course, Collins was able to experience weightlessness flight using the F-104 Starfighter. After graduating from the class, Collins reapplied to the NASA program and was once again asked to go through exams. This time, though, after completing them, he was selected to be part of the third group of astronauts for NASA. Immediately, Collins was put on the Gemini project. This was basically a test run for what would be the Apollo moon landing and would test if a spacewalk was possible. In July 1966, Gemini 10 was launched into space with Collins and his crewmate John Young aboard. Their mission was to dock their spacecraft to the Agena target vehicle and complete two spacewalks. The spacewalks were crucial as the prior Gemini 9 mission faced complications in their attempts to spacewalk. Although their spacesuits did cause some issues like lithium pouring into Collins' helmet, Collins was able to dock and complete his spacewalks in the Agena vehicle. The Gemini 10 mission was a huge success and laid the groundwork for what would become the moon landing. After two days in space, Collins and Young returned home and NASA put Collins into the Apollo project. Although Collins was set for the Apollo 8 mission, he noticed that his left leg was experiencing pain and issues walking. He visited the doctor and was diagnosed with a herniated disc that required surgery. Due to his scheduled time to heal after surgery, Collins would miss out on the Apollo 8 mission. But NASA had other plans for Collins. Michael Collins' surgery and recovery went well, and he was ready for his next assignment. Because of his success on the Gemini 10 mission, NASA selected him for their most important mission yet, the Apollo 11 mission. He accepted the task, not yet knowing what the objective of the flight was. Once he, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin were selected, they were briefed that the goal of the Apollo 11 mission 
was to put a man on the moon. These three strangers who shared careers as pilots and the same birth year, 1930, went through extreme training to prepare for any situation while on their mission. Michael himself compiled a 117-page book that included 18 contingency scenarios should any problems arise. Each astronaut was assigned their roles for the flight. Due to his prior experience with docking vessels, it was decided that Collins was best to be the command module pilot. However, it meant that he would not step foot on the moon and instead orbit it and dock with the module to take his fellow astronauts home. But Collins did not feel he was being robbed of glory. He knew the importance of his role. NASA also knew his importance and knew that because he would not be televised on the moonwalk, he would not be as famous to the public as his fellow astronauts. To stress how vital Collins was to the Apollo 11 flight, NASA, Aldrin and Armstrong agreed that Collins should be placed center in their photo shoots. It should also be noted that the iconic Apollo 11 eagle on the moon emblem was designed by Michael Collins. The eagle is obvious as the limb. It's also a symbol of America without being too overt. As you can see, it carries an olive branch to show that we go to the moon in peace. On July 16, 1969, the Apollo 11 rocket shot into space. Should it succeed on placing a man on the moon, those three pilots would change the world forever. The launch went without a hitch, and three days later, the three astronauts reached the moon's orbit. The next day, under careful watch from the NASA Command Center in Houston, the Lunar Module Eagle separated from the Command Module Columbia and headed for the moon. Shortly after their departure, Colin was struck with fear, not for his own well-being, but for the well-being of the two astronauts who were set to make history. He'd got to know the families of his fellow astronauts and realized that if anything would go wrong on their voyage, he would have to return home alone and face those families. Luckily for him, though, the Eagle landed safely on the moon, and at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Time on July the 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong emerged from the lunar module and became the first man on the moon. While the live broadcast began with Neil Armstrong claiming, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Collins was above him, orbiting the moon. Knowing that the mission was a success, Collins found himself in tranquility. He was alone, orbiting a rock in space and sometimes losing all communication with Earth. Mission Control even stated, not since Adam has any human known such solitude as Mike Collins is experiencing during this 47 minutes of each lunar revolution. And yet he found the experience to be profound for he'd seen what few men had seen before. He saw the vast universe in front of him. And if mankind had made it this far, there was no limit to what mankind could achieve next. After nearly 21 hours, Armstrong and Aldrin left the moon. Collins carefully maneuvered the Columbia module to dock with the Eagle module. The three astronauts were reunited and headed home. On July 24th, the three astronauts splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, completing their mission. The space race was over and the space age had begun. Despite not being alive to see it, President Kennedy's promise to put a man on the moon was achieved. Thanks to the men and women working tirelessly at NASA and the bravery of all the astronauts, some of which lost their lives in the pursuit of a new frontier, the limits of mankind had been broken. Three pilots, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, were the first to break the barrier of the sky and introduce a new era of exploration. All three astronauts were quarantined and then went on a world tour across 25 countries sharing their experience. However, one thing bothered Collins. It was often stated to him that the Americans finally did it rather than we finally did it. For Michael Collins, it wasn't a race or competition. It was the chance for mankind to come together and venture to places thought once impossible to track. Despite experiencing space and flying over the moon, Collins thought more about what Earth looked like from up there. Collins remarked 50 years after he took off to space. As I look back on Apollo 11, 
I more and more am attracted to my recollection, not of the moon, but of Earth, tiny little Earth in its little black velvet background. Michael Collins passed away on April 28, 2021, at the age of 90 due to cancer, leaving behind a legacy that could only be matched by the two other men he flew to the moon with, 